Well, thanks, uh, Janine, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I'm going to tell you uh, a long story uh, today about how I started this in um, 1976, and I'll take you through all the research that I've done. Uh, in 1976, I started, this was my PhD uh, thesis. And uh, as the years passed, uh, we started using technology more and more and try to demonstrate uh, the different mechanisms that may be involved in this blind sight, which was a, a strange name at the time. So uh, in normal subjects, uh, the, the visual uh, system uh, is organized in such a way as uh, I imagine that everybody knows this, but uh, let's just go through. Whatever is on, in, in the left visual field, uh, the information goes, goes to the right hemisphere and vice versa. Whatever is presented in the right visual field, the information arrives to uh, the, uh, the left hemisphere. Uh, but there are other pa pathways that exist, and those are uh, 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 a pathway that goes to, from the retina to the pulvinar and also to the superior colliculus. And the, the superior colliculus is the structure that we are particularly interested in, especially in hemispherectomy subjects where there is an ablation of the whole hemisphere. So these are the pathways. The retina, lateral geniculate nucleus, and the cortical visual areas. And then there are these other pathways that we started looking at more and more uh, after there were lesions in the cortical visual areas and patients began reporting that they could see things but were unaware of them. So the, these pathways are the pulvinar, ipsi, and contralateral, and the superior colliculus that goes only to the contralateral visual hemifield. So knowing this, we uh, started playing with the properties of the pulvinar cells and properties of the superior colliculus cells and looked at the responses of the subjects. So, traditionally, we're talking about destruction of occipital cortex leads to permanent blindness in the contralateral visual field. This was something uh, that was reported in the literature up to a, about 1974 when Weisskrantz came up with the term blind sight. Because there were residual functions that have that been described in the cortically blind uh, hemifields. So, the term blind sight was coined as the ability to respond to visual stimuli in the blind visual field without consciously experiencing them. So blind sight is what we uh, can describe it as, is a special form of unconscious vision that can be observed in the blind field of hemianopic patients. And these patients have an ability to respond to visual stimuli in the blind visual field while lacking the feeling of having seen them and they report an inability to see objects, but if pressed to guess at their location, they display a capacity to point at them with reasonable accuracy. Okay. Now, there are, there are several studies that, that uh, came up after that with implicit processing. So there were skin conductance tests. So from responses, uh, from stimuli that were presented in the blind field, you could evoke uh, electrodermal responses that were reported as unseen. And uh, in forced choice, forced choice guessing, you, can find, you could find discrimination uh, was possible between uh, an X and a circle, and there were also examples of figure completion. And there are also tests of direct behavior, so localization tests. Present something in the, in the, in the blind part of the visual field and ask the subject to locate uh, the, the stimuli, and usually there it's uh, above chance. So uh, then the uh, Weisskrantz went into two types of blind sight, the type 1 blind sight, where there is unconscious residual visual ability and associated with a retinal tactile pathway, and there is a type 2 blind sight where there is some awareness of residual visual abilities. People have claimed that this type 2 blind sight is maybe due to artifacts such as spared striate cortex that may be responsible for the, the, uh, the visual abilities and nothing to do with something unconscious. Uh, 
And this is a fair uh, criticism. So we looked at type 1 blind sight because our subjects had no uh, cortical uh, um, visual areas left on one side. Or at least they were, these areas were disconnected from the rest of the brain. So there were others, I'm not going to go too much into this, but there, are, there is action blind sight that have been coined by Dan Kurt and Rosetti. So here we have a, so a direct behavior towards the blind uh, uh, stimuli. So there's grasping, pointing, so locating by uh, saccades. And this, this, the pathway uh, is the superior colliculus, palvinar, and posterior parietal cortex, what is commonly called the dorsal stream. And then there's attention blind sight where there's forced choice guessing, and uh, so there you can do motion direction or spatial summation effect. This is what we're going to talk about here. Uh, so here the, the pathway is superior colliculus, palvinar, extra stride visual cortex. And then there's agnosopia where, where, where there is forced choice, forced choice guess, guessing and you push in, into looking at wavelengths and form discrimination. In, in, uh, in our case, this is uh, highly unlikely that we would see this. Now, the limitations of the previous research, as I said, there's anatomical. So previous studies mainly used subjects that had circumscribed lesions, and so and blind sight may be due to the spared islands of, of uh, visual cortex. So the neuro, neuronal correlate of blind sight remains inu, elusive from this kind of subjects that were used with circumscribed lesions. And then the type of, of experiment also that is used uh, is a forced choice paradigm, which may uh, reflect some kind of bias on the part of the subject and not necessarily uh, uh, residual visual abilities. And there's also light scatter, control for eye movement. We've done these experiments and uh, looking at eye scatter, uh, light scatter, and there definitely is light scatter that may be used as a cue and uh, may... Be, uh, may uh, uh, suggests that blind sight is artifactual. So, um, uh, here we go. So what we did is we had access to hemispherectomy subjects. So these are extraordinary subjects. Uh, first of all, it's a good model for studying residual visual abilities because the whole hemisphere has been removed or disconnected, as you can see here. So there is a contralateral hemianopia without macular sparing. So this is not unusual to see that, that somebody that has had a hemispherectomy, I don't have time to show you a clip, but somebody that has had a hemispherectomy feels great uh, uh, after, uh, after this kind of surgery because you, usually the, the surgery is done to treat uh, uncontrollable epilepsy. So these subjects are unable to do anything, and uh, they're practically vegetables. And... Uh, uh, after the surgery, they feel great. Their IQ goes up, and uh, I have subjects that are fantastic that have above average IQ and, uh, and uh, work and speak several languages, and they only have one hemisphere. And uh, as Dr. Rasmussen used to say at the, uh, at the MNI, uh, bad brain is, is worse than, than, uh, than the whole brain, so... You know, if you have bad brain, it's better to remove it. So the visual pathways in hemispherectomy, what happens is you have uh, the, here an example. The right hemisphere is removed. There is blindness in the left uh, visual field, but then there are these pathways that exist from the retina to the uh, uh, contralateral pulvinar and also the superior colliculus. So if we want to know, if we observe uh, visual abilities, if we use uh, the properties of the, cell, of the collicular cells and properties of the pulvinar cells and we compare the responses, we may be able to establish the neural mechanism of blind sight, at least in hemispherectomy subjects. So uh, uh, just a preamble, in the pulvinar, there's a there are contralateral retinal connections, and, there, and there's input from color opponent ganglion cells. So pulvinar cells are sensitive to color. In the superior colliculus, there are, there are ipsi lateral connections, and there are no retinal S-cone inputs, so they're colorblind to blue-yellow stimuli. Uh, 
And uh, they are excitatory, but that's, that's fine. And then there's the Sprague effect, where there is restoration of visual orientation in hemianopic cats by modulating su superior collicular function. If you cut the connection between the two uh, superior colliculi, you can reinstate vision in the cat, in the blind field. So there is an interaction that exists between the superior colliculus, and, and, and this is what we used as a premise. And we uh, uh, also thought that this was the most likely neuronal component involved in blindside. So we tried to demonstrate this. This is only to show you that uh, uh, parametric, uh, parametric testing will demonstrate that there is no macular sparing and, there, and that the subject reports being blind in one part of the visual field, in half the visual field. Uh, these are the four subjects we're going to be talking about uh, uh, along uh, in, in, these, uh, in this talk. And uh, this is the information. I don't have time to go into it. Um, only to say that there are uh, um, three right hemisphere and one left. And notice also this onset of seizures which is probably the thing to, to, to be aware of, rather than the age at surgery. Age at, at surgery uh, uh, is, is simply because uh, it arrives late, because uh, everything else has been tried, and then as a last result, you do the, you do the surgery. <clears throat> and we've been following these subjects. Now they're like 40, 30, et cetera, because we've been following them for almost 30 years now. So I'm going to show you uh, the kind of experiments we did, and we demonstrated there, are mo there is motion detection and localization in the blind field from these subjects. Uh, we also demonstrated that, that uh, again, we, even with, with, with uh, eye movements that were checked with a stabilized, stabilized visual field detection, meaning that once you set the, uh, the, uh, the apparatus, the whole scene moves along with the eyes. So it's impossible to, to go and look at the stimulus. The whole scene moves uh, along with the eyes. And then there's the spatial summation effect, uh, which we used extensively because it's, it's great in the sense of uh, the subject. If the, the, the premise is that the, the uh, subject will respond more quickly to two stimuli than to a single stimulus. This is something that we observe all the time. So. If we put two stimuli, uh, one in each visual field, what we find is that the subjects respond more quickly to the two stimuli presented bilaterally than to a single stimulus presented unilaterally, which means that somehow one uh, hemifield, the blind hemifield, is able to influence the response that the subject is making to that stimulus that they're perceiving in their intact field. This is the first apparatus we had around uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, the technology has changed, but this is a giant perimeter. We tracked eye movements here, and uh, there was a fixation uh, uh, point. The, the points were flashing, and as only one uh, remained on, the subject had to press on the button, and then the stimuli were presented. And we could move the monitors about the perimeter. So uh, this was the, and then the subject was pointing, and we could measure uh, the, 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 their, their pointing with these lines that were here, representing the degrees up to 180 degrees. Okay. So what we find, uh, first of all, uh, this is intact field, this is blind field, and this is the degrees in the, in the sorry, in the, in the periphery. And uh, the straight line here is what, the, what we, is expected, the responses that are expected. And you, what you can see is the, in the intact field, the subjects are, are pretty good at locating the stimuli. And in their blind field, they're not bad either. Although here the, you see that they're off. As they go, they, there's a tendency to go off, to make errors. This one is not bad. The, there's a bit of a tendency to go off, and this one is not bad too. So the first thing that, uh, that we, we reported is that uh, they can distinguish blank from targets trials reliably. So they know if you present if something, they can tell you you did present something, but I haven't seen it. 
but they know that you, they, we didn't present anything. So they know that blank trials were presented and they can differentiate them. That's the first thing. Uh, they make more errors, of course, in their blind field for localization. Um, but the results of correct target localizations were similar to normal subjects. So they're not totally off. They're not saying, I'm not seeing anything. They're, uh, they're not accurate. And two uh, hemispherectomies demonstrated an ability to uh, uh, detect movement in the blind visual field, although it was affected by the velocity. So there is some awareness, and there are individual differences between the subjects. Okay. Then this is the, the stabilized visual field detection that we found. And again, this is the perimetry testing, and you see that there is no macular sparing on the conventional testing. But when you look at the stabilized perimetry, what you find is that there is an island of sparing that goes, in these two subjects at least, an island of sparing here along the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the macular region, and that extends into here. And in this subject, you can see that the quadrant here is totally blind, but there, is, there are uh, the visual abilities in this region here, extending into the blind field. Uh, but here, notice that here, the subject is reporting being not seeing anything. And finally, the spatial summation effect paradigm. There's the speeding up of reaction time with two stimuli compared to a single one. So the advantage of this paradigm is that it requires only a response to a consciously perceived stimuli in their, in their blind field. And the subjects don't have to make a forced choice. And the eye movements are minimized because they're looking and you present both stimuli simultaneously. So what we find uh, with the spatial summation effect is, is uh, that uh, this, is single, this is the reaction time and each subject. And what we find is that there are two subjects who respond more quickly to double uh, stimuli than to a single one, uh, whereas the other two do not. So essentially, there are two subjects out of four that show a blind sight. And uh, the interesting part is that the, pre the presentation in the blind field has influenced the reaction time to the consciously perceived stimulus. So the advantages of the study requires a reaction only to consciously perceive the stimuli. So from something conscious, from a conscious response, we can infer on unconscious abilities, okay? Uh, and so we, there's fixation, there's no spared islands of visual cortex, and there's no light scatter. Uh, you'll see we used uh, all kinds of different stimuli that demonstrated this. So we, we pushed and... Um, we used this time, instead of using just conventional black and white stimuli, we went to uh, use, uh, we used uh, blue and yellow stimuli, which, uh, uh, and we compared black and white versus um, uh, blue, yellow. And if the, if the superior colliculus are involved, we would expect responses uh, uh, to be above chance with black and white stimuli and to be at chance with blue and yellow. Uh, I'm not going to go into this, only to, to, this was only to pass the message that, that the superior colliculus has no input from uh, retinal S cones, meaning that they don't, uh, they're blind to blue-yellow stimuli. So these are the, uh, uh, the stimuli we use. You see how similar they are, except for the blue patches that are here. Okay, so uh, this is iso isochromatic black and white stimuli, and we presented on one side, on the other, and on both simultaneously, and uh, with blue and yellow, same thing. So th this is the way it looked. Respond to this, or respond to this, or respond to this. Always as quickly as you can. So for the, we had 16 control subjects to, that we looked at, and we saw a spatial summation effect in all of them. Again, the reaction time and responses, the bilateral, unilateral. You see the bilateral are always more quicker in the response, and 
for both blue and yellow and for black and white. Now, with uh, uh, hemispherectomy subjects without blind sight, we don't see the effect. Okay? And for those with blind sight, we see that they respond more quickly to black and white stimuli, but not to bilateral blue and yellow stimuli. So, how, uh, the, the conclusion for this is that the normal subjects respond to both. Hemispherectomy subjects with blind sight respond to achromatic, but not to blue-yellow. And those without blind sight do not respond to any of them. So this strongly suggests an, involve, an involvement of the superior colliculus in blind sight. So we went and, uh, as the technology developed, we went and uh, did uh, fMRI studies. Excuse me. This is the, uh, what, what we used. This is the baseline condition, and this was a moving target with uh, both of these gratings moving in opposite directions. And this was done in order to rule out scatter that potentially could have uh, helped the subject respond. And what we find is that when we make presentations in the, in the uh, uh, blind field, there are ipsilateral extrastriate activations in area V5, V3, and V3A. So this region is activated, but from stimulation in the blind field. So somehow the information gets to the other hemisphere and uh, putting the, uh, the behavioral experiments together with this, we thought we had a strong case for the superior colliculi being involved. So, uh, again, we, we, we saw the, this effect. Uh, when we looked at the effect sizes within the superior colliculi to uh, uh, achromatic and escon isolating stimuli, we find that there is significant activation only to achromatic stimuli. And this was consistent with previous studies in, in non-human primates. <coughs> and when we look at uh, uh, black and white stimuli in the right visual field, black and white in the left visual field, we see that for one, this subject that doesn't show blind sight, there's no activation. And this one that does show blind sight, there is activation. We don't see it very well, but it's there. On, in fact, bilateral activation. And uh, this uh, uh, the CC is a control subject, so you see that there's no problem with the control subject to activate those regions. And uh, for the blue-yellow, again, the responses are the same, but look at this subject here, whether uh, while he activates with black and white in the left uh, visual field, he does not with blue and yellow. And uh, uh, again, this is essentially uh, uh, demonstrating the, the same aspect here. So when we look uh, at the, the uh, fMRI studies, the control subjects, they, they show uh, activation in area, uh, bilaterally in areas V1, V2, with both color and black and white stimuli. And the, their, their responses are enhanced with the spatial summation effect. Okay, whether it's in the right uh, visual field or in the left, so you see this enhancement. The subject SE with blind sight, we see uh, in, the, in the intact visual field there's no problem with black and white and blue-yellow, but there is no activation with blue-yellow, but there is in with black and white, frontal eye fields and area V5. And with the special uh, summation effect, there is an enhancement of response only with black and white stimuli. And for this one, without blind sight, there is no activation and no enhancement. Okay? So, to summarize, unilateral stimulus presentation, achromatic and escon isolating stimuli. In the normal visual hemifields, there is no problem with activating area V1, V2. In the blind visual hemi field of blind sight subjects, there is activation of visual areas, frontal eye fields V5, to achromatic stimuli only. And for bilateral stimulus presentations, there is enhanced activation in control subject, uh, 
and enhanced activation in blind sight subjects to achromatic stimuli only. So to conclude, the, the human superior colliculus does not receive any s cone input, so it's blind to s cone isolating stimuli. Therefore, blind sight is likely mediated by s cone independent collicular pathway, which is black and white. So uh, then we were curious to look at tractography because if this is the case, can we see a pathway going from the, the uh, 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 from the remaining uh, hemisphere to the superior colliculus? Can we tease out that kind of pathway with DTI? And this was this, the question was why do some hemispherectomy subjects show blind sight and others not? and which technique can be used for investigation. So we tried uh, DTI tractography. And we first did it to, uh, to in healthy subjects to, to look at the connectivity of the pulvinar. <coughs> so uh, when we looked at the connectivity of the pulvinar in six normal control subjects, uh, uh, we find that the, the, the connections are really nice and clear and we can tease them out. When we put the seed mask here, we see that there are definitely uh, um, connections to many areas in, in each hemisphere. So uh, the, the areas that, that, we, that we can see are, are listed here, the different one, caudate, frontal life fields, the superior calica. So, so we can see that there are connections in the pulvinar in all of these regions. So, and they were, uh, these tracts were, were present in all of the subjects and they are projected to identical ipsilateral areas. This uh, gave us confidence that the tractography for uh, looking at uh, subcortical structures was possible. So uh, we also uh, established that we wanted to look at something that is re would be really, really clear in hemispherectomy subjects, and this would be the corticospinal tract. So in hemispherectomy subjects, they all have normal ipsilateral motor functions and only contralateral upper limb paresis, but they don't have a hemiplegia. So we looked at the connectivity of the corticospinal tract, and we find, again, a high, uh, you can see the, the connections are clear on, on the remaining hemisphere. These are the control subjects, and you can see on the remaining hemisphere the corticospinal tract is really uh, uh, nice and clear. So we looked at the superior colliculus, and in the normal subjects, what we find from the superior colliculus are connections with the frontal eye fields, parietal cortex, visual association areas, prefrontal areas, and primary visual areas. So you can see them clearly here with the seed mask in the different uh, right or left superior colliculus. So this was nice. How do hemispherectomy subjects do, uh, fare compared to these? So in hemispherectomy subjects without blind sight, this is one subject, what we find is that there is an absence of collicular connections to the contralateral remaining hemisphere. The ipsilateral projections are present, but they're weaker compared to normal subjects. So you can see here and here and here. But when on the other side, you can see that there are no connections here on the hemispherectomy side. In this subject with blind sight, SE, you can see from the hemispherectomy side, there are connections to the frontal eye fields, parietal cortex, visual association areas, prefrontal and primary. In fact, they look identical, practically, the two sides meaning that, the, that, that there are connections that likely exist and that uh, uh, may explain why these subjects have residual visual abilities without being conscious of them. And subject DR, again, is the same thing. She has blind sight, and you can see that the connections that, that are shown are practically similar from the hemispherectomy side and the healthy side. So obviously there are uh, connections that exist there. So to summarize, superior collicular tracts and hemispherectomized subjects without blind sight, it, this suggests that there is a de degeneration of both superior colliculi in hemispherectomy subjects without blind sight. And it would, it's not surprising because 
even though the disease is, is, is uh, restricted to one hemisphere, it may be that there is some damage on the other side as well in certain subjects, but not in others. Um, in in this, uh, these subjects with blind sight, they demonstrated strong IPSI and contralateral projections from the superior colliculus to primary visual areas, visual association areas, prefrontal areas. This is for subject SE. Subject DR showed uh, connections with prefrontal areas and the internal capsules. So this is something that we were always aware and that we can see now anatomically that there are individual differences between the subjects and that the superior colliculus is the neural, neuronal correlate underlying blind sight, at least in hemispheric to my subjects. So to conclude... We show that there is, in hemispherectomized subjects, we show that there is, uh, uh, that blind sight exists behaviorally. We show that there is no blind sight to s cone dependent stimuli in hemispherectomized subjects. So blind sight is mediated by a direct retinal connection to the superior colliculus through an s cone independent pathway. DTI tractography confirms the behavioral results by demonstrating superior curricular connections to the remaining hemisphere in hemispherectomized subjects with blind sight. So, to conclude, blind sight subjects remain unaware of the information processed in their blind field, possibly because of a lack of synchronicity in cerebral activation. For conscious perception, a specific synchronized activation pattern of ventral, parietal, and frontal visual areas is believed to be crucial. So our results indicate that hemispherectomy subjects with blind sight are able to enhance visual performance in their blind field, but remain unaware of visual processing, presumably because they are unable to access a more complex synchronous cortical activation pattern invo involving higher top-down mechanisms necessary for conscious vision. Thank you very much for your attention.